probably closer to four out of every it's it's, uh, it's like four out of every five um, bites of food come from honeybees or from the pollinating work that they do. Um, in fact, what pe most people don't, understand, don't realize is that Brevard County and this area in Central Florida is at the epicenter of honeybee pollination. And here's how it works. There's a rotation uh, that, that honeybees take. And that is in about September, you will see large semi-trucks of honeybees making their way into the state. And they're brought into this area, areas south of I-4, where Brazilian peppers are ubiquitous. And they'll set out thousands, hundreds of thousands of beehives. And they feed in the fall on Brazilian pepper bloom. And these hives will become strong and they'll what they call overwinter right in our in our area. If you go south down toward Felsmere and Sebastian and Grant and those areas, oftentimes you'll see out in the middle of a cow pasture in the distance, you'll see numbers of white boxes, and those are bees. And those same honeybees then will get stronger over the winter. And then in February, they'll bring those trucks back, they'll load those honeybees up and they'll take them to California, where they'll drop them on the almond harvest and about 2.6 million beehives will be taken to hauled into California in that month time frame of January, February, and March, where they'll, they'll pollinate the almond crop. At the end of that time, those same honeybees are packed up and they're trucked to the northern plains, to North and South Dakota, Minnesota, all of those areas up north where they'll feed uh, on um, wildflowers and things like that. And that's where you get your major honey crops from. After that is over with, they'll be packed up once again and they'll be distributed down the east coast of the United States from Maine where black where blueberries are, are produced and pollinated on down the coastline toward Georgia and, and the south where watermelons and squash and all the foods that we like to eat. And you'll find those uh, pollinated by, by honeybees. And, and that's one of the reasons why they're so important. But there's a third reason and, and we don't talk about it as much, but it's that honeybees as representative. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. We are winning the war on insects. By that, I mean, we could kill large numbers of insects tomorrow if we want to. Um, in fact, I've read somewhere that it says if we wanted to eradicate the mosquito, we could do it tomorrow. The technology is there to do it. But of course, what about unintended consequences and so forth like that? So we're winning the war on, on insects. And I just put a couple of pictures up here of some different insects. The truth is we love honeybees. We don't keep track of other insects so much. And so the honeybee becomes the canary in the proverbial coal mines. And when we know that honeybees are under stress and we know that honeybees are dying, we get excited about it or worried about it. We wanna do something about correcting that, that particular um, negative event. But honeybees are just the tip of the proverbial iceberg. There are so many other species that are under the same stress. And so some of those stressors include things like this. And the next slide will illustrate that. What's killing the bees? And really there's four things we could talk about. Pesticides, pests, uh, loss of forage, and climate change. The, the sad part is if I was doing a lecture about bees or about rather about birds, or if I was doing a lecture uh, about the, the Indian River Lagoon, many of these same four things are the exact same things that are killing the wildlife, the birds, and the other things that we're concerned about. Pesticides, I think that goes without saying that when you, when you spray crops, large areas of crops, um, bees will get on those crops and they're an insect and they're, you're killing the insects on the crops. The unintended consequence, bees are killed. Uh, pests, bees are affected by pests and and there's a tremendous way that um, evolution will help insects and bees deal with those pests. Unfortunately, as we talked about a while ago, when we're moving bees all around the country, we are introducing pests into the hive. Um, wax moths, small hive beetles, um, varroa mice, pro propylalops, which is another form of mite. We're introducing these to the bees and they cannot adapt and deal with them quick enough. And so we as beekeepers are in the business of trying to help our bees overcome those, those pests in their hive. Um, but they have a deleterious effect and they can kill bees. And so there are pests that we have introduced to the bee populations and they, have a, they can kill bees. Uh, loss of forage. 
while ago, Kay was asking where I was, and I was telling him we're in West Melbourne here doing the presentation. And immediately to my west, a large housing development just went in over a thousand acres that five years ago was all forage, all forests and wildflowers and trees. And immediately to my east across Minton Road, they're clearing a whole section, another 10, 12 acres of land, which just last month was forage for our bees and for other insects and animals that is going away. So loss of forage is a problem. And specifically with developments, because what we call uh, weeds um, in, our, in our yawns and we try to kill, bees call forage. I've tried that excuse with my wife quite a few times and she doesn't buy it that I'm not mowing the yard this week because I'm not, I'm not cutting the grass, I'm killing forage. So anyway, whatever we need to do with that. And then of course, the third, the fourth reason that bees are under stress, the fourth reason that things are difficult is of course, climate change. And, and what that does is it changes the season that bees have evolved to expect certain crops to be available. And so when those crops slowly begin to mature later or earlier, it interrupts the bee's natural cycle of forage and feed. So those are some of the, the factors that are affecting um, bees and affecting honeybee populations and affecting their health and continued growth. Um, just a couple of quick fun honeybee facts. Um, bees, even though we talk about the forage, they can fly up to six miles to forage. They do their best foraging within 300 yards because they, there's an equation that you, you know, the, the cost benefit analysis that, you, that they run, which is going further, they have to burn more resources to get back to the hive. So if they fill their crop with hunt with nectar and use half of it just to fuel their flight, when they get back, they have less nectar. So they can fly up to six miles. They do their best work within 300 yards of their hive. Um, a, a single bee can visit up to 1500 flowers a day and in her entire life, a single bee will make about one twelfth of a tablespoon uh, of honey. Um, a pound of honey takes between two to four million flowers just for a pound. Now, I want us to do the math here real quick. And I want you to look at the number of beehives that we have up and down this particular apiary. Each one of these hives will produce between 40 to 60 pounds of honey. Do the math. And you recognize that this small apiary right here is responsible for pollinating hundreds of millions of, of flowers in, in this particular area. Um, in a nectar flow, bees can collect four to five pounds of nectar per day, uh, meaning a whole hive. And then some other things. One of the things that's fascinating, especially to kids, is that bees can flap their wings 200 times per second. If you look at a bee, there's nothing aerodynamic about a bee. They are as aerodynamic as a rock, but they produce lift by flapping their wings hundreds of times, not a minute, but a second. This is a honeybee and you can see that they have, by the way, people ask me, what about killer bees? Let me just tell you, there's no such thing. There's Africanized bees. But if you see this bee, this may be the exception. If you see this bee run, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, in the meantime, you can see that the bee has four wings and she has those four wings because when she fills up her crop with honey and then she fills up her corbicula with pollen, uh, she can actually carry almost half of her body weight back to the hive. So the bee will flap her wings 200 times in order to get enough lift. And if you look at, like I said, but not very aerodynamic. She does it by creating lift with energy and she burns a lot of energy to do that. That's why a long forage is not near as efficacious as a short forage trip. Um, let's talk one more slide here before we actually get onto the fun stuff. And that is um, honeybee culture. Honeybees, by the way, how do you spell honeybee? You'll notice it's spelled as two words. My spell checker, every time I type it, tries to correct it to one word, but Dr. Ellis at University of Florida tells us that it's actually two words, honeybee. Scientifically, that's because if the first word describes what the second word does, for instance, butterflies, they're neither butter nor flies, so they're butterflies. But a honeybee is a bee and it produces honey, so it's a honeybee, it's two words, that's the correct spelling. Um, spell checker, uh, be excluded anyway. Uh, so. Honeybees or Apis mellifera are considered the Western honeybee. They are not indigenous to this area. They are an invasive species. 
They were brought here back in the, in the early settler period. We have records that shows that they brought honeybees from Europe and that's where they proliferate. So the, the Western honeybee. The honeybee is a eusocial, which means they can only live in colonies. They, they, and they produce what is called a super organism that the, the sum of the parts is much greater than the single part. Uh, and they, even though they're single, even though they're insects and cold-blooded, as a colony, they can produce some remarkable um, things. They can thermoregulate the temperature of a hive. A hive inside will be around 96.8 degrees all the time, sun shining or in the middle of the winter. They thermoregulate, even though an individual bee cannot do that. Uh, they collectively raise the young. The queen lays the eggs. She never deals with them again. Worker bees take care of all of those kind of things. So. Um, honeybees are, are eusocial and they live in colonies. Now that takes us to the next slide because this takes us right to where we are today. The honeybee, in honeybee culture, I want to help us understand the language. And that is this, that bees live in a colony. The first picture on the upper left there is of a bee colony that's on a tree, a tree limb. And you can see that it's got honeycomb and wax in that colony. That is a bee colony. And bee colonies, uh, th those bees are called feral. They live in the wild. We don't call them wild bees because that would be if they were indigenous. They're feral. They live in the woods, out in the woods. So they're feral bees. And that is a colony of bees. A bee collector or a beekeeper will take that colony and put it in a bee hive. So now the hive has a colony in it. So the correct worst pronunciation, or not way to describe it or talk about it is I have a beehive and it's got a healthy colony inside. The upper right hand picture is a picture that many times you'll see around this time of year, and that's a swarm. And when a bees reproduce, they reproduce by kicking off a whole swarm. Half the bees will leave with the queen. They'll bivouac on a limb until they can find a new destination and they'll go to that new home. Beehives are collected in an area called an apiary. An apiary will contain a number of different bee or a number of beehives. And this is where we are. We are in this apiary here in West Melbourne. Our club has two apiaries. And if you're a member of the club, or even if you're not, if you want to show up on Sunday afternoon, that information will be at the end. You can actually spend some time putting your hands in a beehive. We invite you to do that. Um, Kraz now, I want to take it over here to Kraz while we're doing this. And he's going to talk to you very quickly about a beehive and how a beehive collects bees. Kraz? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Kraz. I am going to show you uh, the in industry standard for beehives nowadays. It's called the Langstroth hive. And a Langstroth hive consists of a couple of different layers. And I'm gonna show you the layers. Put over there a little bit, Stuart. There you go, uh, right there. All right, so the he's gonna turn the camera around. Let's see, yes, there we go. That's much better. There okay. we go. Okay, so um, first thing that we have is um, for the colony to live in, for this indust industry standard, they have a Langstroth hive. Uh, Dr. Uh, Reverend Langstroth came up with the bee spacing and, and how to put these together. And for a while, this has been the industry standard. So what we've got here is the bottom board, and this is a screened bottom board. A lot of uh, debate nowadays whether the bottom board should have screen or be solid wood. This happens to be a screened bottom board, and sometimes you can put uh, they say that it's for ventilation. People can use it for ventilation, also for pest control and pest regulation for mites. If you if you treat for mites, they get, you put a board underneath and then you can count uh, the amount of mites that come out of there. So that is the bottom board. Next we have an excluder, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, an entrance reducer. This device um, just lets you regulate how big of an entrance you want into the colony. Uh, bees have to defend their colony, uh, have to defend their hive against other bees sometimes and other intruders, mice and raccoons and other things. So we put this on the end to help the bees uh, keep a healthy colony. A small entrance is good. They have little to defend. And really, if a beehive lands in your soffit or something like that, they only need a little entrance to come in and out to have that cavity that they're going to fill with their colony. So we'll put this on to show you. The next thing we a beehive is made of is a Langstroth box. Uh, this is called a brood box because the lower box, the lower box is where the brood lives. It's, uh, uh, if you can imagine the colony itself being round as opposed to square, you're thinking a round colony in a square box, but 
But yeah, the colony itself is in the middle. What happens is that in the inside of the colony is the brood. It's where the queen will reside and look for cells to lay eggs in. And um, all consisting of honeycomb. So honeycomb is a wax that's produced by the bees. They actually sweat the wax out. Then they pull these little uh, flakes of wax, chew it up, and put it in this hexagonal pattern called honeycomb. And it's made of pure wax. The workers will build this. And depending on what the workers instruct the queen to do, she will lay eggs in the, in the comb. The eggs will turn into larva. The larva then gets capped, turns into a pupa, and an adult bee will emerge from the inside of the honeycomb. So this is the basis of a honeycomb. So the colony itself like I said, it's more like a ball. It's, it's round. So inside is the brood. On the outside is the food. And the food for bees is going to be pollen and nectar. And nectar turns into honey. So the pollen is the protein for the bees. They'll pack it in on their legs and bring it in. And they'll pack it into certain cells with the help of the workers. You have pollen, which is the protein. And you have nectar or honey, which is the carbohydrate source. And that is going to be on the outside of the brood. Now, if, if you think about the brood being in here round, consider the frames almost like the slices of an MRI or a CAT scan, if you will. It, it, the imaging is done this way. So when we do inspections, we'll pull out the frames one by one and inspect them. And what we're really doing is looking at slices of the colony when we pull out each one of the frames. Now, these are just foundation, plastic foundation that have ridges on them where bees can uh, can build their wax and we use this foundation mostly to get them head, a head start but when we use it in honey spinning machines to um to extract the honey from it doesn't blow out the comb if the comb is just their natural comb that centrifugal force can sometimes blow out the comb so here we've got different layers and inside the bottom box usually that we have here the langstroth bottom box this is not a deep box just normally it's a deeper box it has a deeper frame in it and that's the bottom box called the brood box. The brood box is where the queen usually lays the eggs and where baby bees come from or develop. Then on top of these, we put more boxes on top depending on how big the colony is getting. The, the, they're stacked up, as you can see. The one that maybe Stuart's on, it's got a deep box. And then one, two, three supers on it. They're called supers because we put them in a superior position on top of the brood box. And so we build a colony nice and strong from the brood box up and we'll add other supers on top of it. We'll just stack them right in there. And then the bees will move up. Of course, this will, would be filled with more frames and the colony gets larger and larger. When we're finally ready, and we think that there's enough bees in the box to sustain and there is a flow going on. So the flow is an abundance of nectar that's in the area at the time. So when the plants start flowering and have a lot of nectar, that's called a flow, a honey flow or a nectar flow. And those bees will be busy working and filling the empty cells with nectar. And so what we wanna do is utilize that and kind of separate the brood box from the honey supers where the where the worker bees will store that nectar and dry that out to make honey. So what we do is we use this device. It's called the queen excluder. It's a grate that the spaces on the queen excluder is small enough for a worker bee to go through, but not big enough for the queen's body or the drone bodies to go through. Her abdomen is too big. She's too big of a, of a creature to go through this space, but what, in all intents and purposes, what happens is that she no longer can get up here. The workers will stack another box. I'll show you how this would work. We would put the queen excluder here or on top of another super. And then when the honey super is placed up here, the queen can't lay eggs. So no brood can be in the top box, but it would be laid with, filled up with just nectar. And that nectar, once it's filled in here, the bees will use their amazing sense of uh, height and air dynamics just to, to dry it out. Uh, to, they'll just continue to dry the, dry the nectar down to a lower water content so it's thick enough to become honey. Once that happens, the worker bees will cap the honeycomb 
and then you will have frames that are ready to go of capped honey. So the, they, cap the, they cap the comb to encapsulate their brood in a cocoon, and they also cap the honey uh, to dry it up and seal it up. So, and then last but not least, we've got our top to go on the top. And that is a beehive, and that's where your colony is split. Thanks, Kras. And well, I'm sure I've seen that some questions have been popping up. And as they pop up, we will answer those in the hours and days to come. Now we're gonna take you over to a, a real live beehive. And I wanna just talk to you as we're making our way over there to Bonnie, where she's got the hive already opened up and ready to go. Um, I'm gonna show you the entrance that Krabs was talking about. These are actually bees at the entrance of a hive. And you can see them, they're hanging out. Uh, and they're getting in preparation when bees come in and out and they're, ex they're bringing honey back and they're bringing nectar and they're bringing pollen. You can perhaps see some of the bees as they're flying out of the, the entrance way. Um, some of these bees up here are called guard bees. They're ensuring that the bees that come into the colony are, as Kras mentioned, robber bees, making sure they're excluded from the hive and uh, making sure that the bees that come in and out are bees that are domiciled in this particular hive. A bee that goes out foraging will come back and they'll always come back to that particular hive, which would be kind of confusing, perhaps if you look at them, but that's why bees in our apiary are not, or hives rather, are not all the same color. They're different colors because the bees can actually recognize which hive uh, is their particular hive and they'll always always come back to it. So now we're heading over here to uh, to Bonnie and Bonnie has already opened up a hive yeah, and she's got it out here. Tell us what we're looking at, Bonnie. This is a frame of uh, capped honey, actually. It's all ready to be uh, harvested. You can tell that it's harvested because it's sealed off by the um, bees and that shows that the humidity level is uh, perfect for harvesting. If we look at the other side, you will see that on the bottom, there's still a lot of nectar in there. And what they will do is uh, flap their wings and evaporate the water out of there until it gets to the proper water content. How much, how much does that frame weigh? How much honey are you holding in your hand right there? I'd say about four pounds. Four pounds of honey right there. Four pounds. Okay. So this, this uh, next frame that we're going to be beautiful. Oh, wow. Look at that one. Picking out mm -hmm. this one here. It actually has cap brood. Ah. And these are uh, eggs of the, uh, the use your smoke. smoke this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, these are, uh, this is a brood frame and the queen had laid eggs and, uh, and the brood has been capped. So it takes uh, 19 days for the worker bees to emerge after they've been laid. Here's one being born right now. Oh, wow. Hang on. Look at this. So she's right now chewing the, 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 the adult bee is chewing the capping off and she will emerge, but she's a baby. So she has just come from, because she's coming out of her cocoon. Mm -hmm. A couple of them. There's about three of them right there. Yeah. And as Bonnie said, this takes about about 21 days, 24 days to get to this point from the time the egg is laid, pupates, larvates, and then it comes out. And um, this section right here, this whole section that we're looking at, the queen probably laid those eggs on the same day. She lays up to 1,500 eggs a day. So all of these bees will be emerging within the next few hours and at least by the next 24 hours, this whole area will be open. The bees then will turn around, clean that area out, and the queen will know that she can start laying new eggs in here again. And she'll do this every day of her life, 1,500 times. Exactly. Let me see what's on the other side. Oh, wow. This other side, uh, we still have some more cat brood. I was uh, looking to see, and with nectar coming in, more nectar over in the corners. If you notice that they always keep uh, honey close by to where the eggs are because they feed the um, bees something called bee bread, which is pollen that they mix up with the honey. And that's what uh, all the baby bees get as uh, they're developing. Uh, the next frame that we have is a couple more uh, bees emerging there. 
Wow, look at that. <laughs> Beautiful. Wow. Uh, we have uh, this next frame. We have uh, some drone cone, uh, drone cells. Wait a minute. What are drones? Drones are the males of the bees. Okay. And their cells are a little bit larger because they're larger bees. And you can see how they're uh, puffed up and not flush with the comb like the worker bees uh, cells were. Now, this looks like water, wet stuff. And what is all that? That is actually the nectar that the bees are bringing in to uh, they'll, uh, evaporate it down and then cap it. And that's actually the beginning of honey. Wow. Now, the same, you showed us a couple other frames, Bonnie. And there's lots and lots of, of, of smaller cells like this and only a few of these. Are, are most of the bees in here males or females? 90% uh, of the worker bees are all females. The worker bees are all females. The drones are only in the hives from uh, spring until fall uh, when they're needed. Their only job is to get the DNA of the queen out into the community. And so uh, when she feels that the hive is uh, strong enough, she starts laying eggs. And that's actually one of the um, signs that they're ready to uh, swarm or reproduce the colony. Okay, wow. And so this whole thing, the bottom line, all, all the way up is filled up with, with eggs and with brood. Right. So is, is this the way the colony operates? What, what's the next step? Do we need to add more supers? What would you suggest we need to do? Um, I wouldn't at this point until I saw this completely filled with uh, 10 frames of bees up here mm -hmm. where there was no room. Then I would add a queen excluder and then maybe a new super. But we've already started getting honey, so the bees are doing their job well. I was wow. trying to see if there were any larvae or any small eggs. Yeah. You could tell a small uh, egg that's one to three days old by uh, looking at it. It um, actually stands up like a grain of rice in the back of the cell. And um, after the third day, it uh, curls up into a C, which uh, turns into the larvae. And then... Um, Look at this bee right here. She's got her tail up in the air and she's just flapping her wings. What is that typically about? Uh, she's actually uh, fanning or uh, trying to evaporate some of the water out of the nectar. Yep. So that uh, after it's to the proper moisture content, then they cap it like uh, up here. And then that's when the beekeeper knows that it'll be ready for harvesting. Will you take all of this honey and when you harvest it or do you leave some in the hive? How does that work? Well, actually the bees make uh, the honey for their food for the winter. So uh, we always try to leave enough for them to be able to survive through the winter. And uh, the extra boxes is usually for us to keep. So the top box, the top supers will be the beekeeper's box and the rest of the honey in the hive will be left for the bees. Exactly. We always want to promote good health and we don't want to stress out our bees by not having enough food for them to survive. Fantastic. Thanks, Bonnie. Thank you. I am going to walk down here a little bit. We're going to look at some of these other beehives as we're going along. You'll notice that there's different sizes and styles of beehives. These are in here for honey production. You can see this one has a queen excluder, already got a queen excluder up top. And then there's smaller boxes. And these boxes are oftentimes either swarms and we're starting a new beehive and it'll grow into a bigger box or it perhaps is being used to raise uh, queens, do queen rearing. And in other words, she mentioned the queen, the single queen in the hive, and that's the most important bee that she lays all the eggs. And if you lose queen, queen becomes, a hive becomes queenless, then you got a problem. So what we do is we sometimes will raise our own queens and we'll use these different boxes, different things. And again, you can walk down the line and each beehive is completely an individual colony and it has a different personality. And uh, you might have, like Bonnie was in that hive down there and it was very, very calm. You saw that I was actually working it barehanded. There was no, I got, I received no stings. Um, every beekeeper always wears a veil to protect your eyes. Um, but the bottom line is that the bees will have different personalities. This apiary, the one we're in now, is actually a rehab yard. And by that, I mean, some of the bees will be 
little bit more energetic or mean. I want to show you this one here. This is very interesting. Uh, for some reason, today I've been watching this one, and there's a lot of bees coming in with pollen uh, on their legs or their corbicula. And we're going to wait just a couple of seconds here for some bees to come home. And when they land, you might just catch a glimpse of on their back. Oh, did you see that when they, they drug a, a dead pupa out of the beehive? And that was an undertaker bee that actually drug it out of the beehive. And as you'll see some bees here in a minute, hopefully land, you might be able to catch a glimpse of some pollen on their on their hind legs. Um, so there's a couple more that just came in. Don't want to waste too much time doing this, but it's just a fascinating. There you go. I don't know if you caught that glimpse when she went in, but she had uh, yellow pollen on her back legs. There's another one. A couple more. There's another one. Yep. You're actually watching them bringing in the food, uh, the the um, protein that is needed for brazing brood and so forth like that. Now we're down here with Kraz, and he's actually in a deep brood box. And we're going to try to find some well, some brood. What I found here is a queen cell. Ah. So there is a new queen that's going to emerge out of there. That is. It looks like a peanut, but here's an older one where a queen has possibly emerged or the side has been chewed out. So we're not sure this is a viable queen cell, but that is what a queen cell looks like. Wow. So there might have been a swarm here recently, mm -hmm. or there may be a queen in here, but she will swarm soon. And this new cell will have a baby queen emerge and it'll reproduce and then so what and when the queen when the queen emerges uh how does how does she start laying eggs does she start laying eggs immediately yeah when the queen comes out she is not ready to lay eggs she needs to be mated and what happens is with a virgin queen a queen who hasn't made it yet she will fly out of her box and with a mile or two area find a drone congregation area that's where the male bees hang out in a big group and wait for a virgin queen to fly through and she will be mated by these drones. It takes a quick mating process. The drone dies in the process and a new drone will mate. So she'll probably mate with 15 bees, drone bees, and return back to this very colony. And after a couple of days with the sperm, sperm mixing with the eggs, and she can, in her body, decide which one egg will be fertilized and which will be unfertilized. And then she will start laying eggs in the colony. Now, Kraz, we were in this hive just a few, about a week or so ago, and we actually found a queen in here. Right. Um, and now that that's not there. So you suggested that it could have been a swarm that left and left the queen, left this hive queenless. And now they're what's called superseding or making a new queen. Correct. Mm -hmm. There could be a, the queen so still hanging out, here. but so this, here you go. Okay, we're gonna go in a couple more cells. I mean, uh, frames. Frames. Oh wow! Look at this. That's just and you can okay, right here. If I don't know if we can, you can see it or not. But if you look down in that hot down in that cell, you should be able to see what looked like little tiny shrimp, white shrimp in the bottom of those cells. What are those? That's the larva. So after the eggs um, start to develop, they'll turn into a C-shaped larva, and then eventually like larva until they are capped into little cocoons and then they will turn pupate and then turn into adults now there's a bee right there i don't know if you saw it but it had like luck like it had a small slight powder on it and when the bees emerged Kraz was talking about that a while ago when the bees emerge from the cell after being born they'll be just a little bit different and there's and they take about another day or two to mature and then they will start doing jobs in the beehive and bees will are like I said, eusocial, and a bee will perform different jobs in the beehive based on their age. The first job a bee does, when I talk to, to kids about this, and I always remind them that the first thing a bee does when it emerges from the cell is it turns around and makes up its bed. There's, it there's cleans it up. Where's that? There she is right there. Do you see her? You can see her. she got the big, wow, look at that. Good eyes. We call Kraz our eagle eyes. She find, he can find queens across the bee yard there she is we have beekeepers that'll look in a yard like this for for several times before they find a queen and here on your very first effort in a beehive you all have seen and found the queen look at that beautiful wow and he's going to put her back in very very carefully but i also believe they might swarm here soon 
You think so? Um, just because that cell is going to emerge, and there's usually not two queens in a colony. Mm -hmm. Yep. And now this colony, that's interesting. It, it doesn't have as many bees as the other colony did a while ago. Why would that be? This one has got a single brood box, and it doesn't have, and you'll see actually down in the frames here, you know, some of them appear actually empty. Why, why is that? Well, it could have already is swarmed. Uh -huh. And so she's newly back and mated, but I didn't see eggs. I, I only saw larva. Mm -hmm. What about you, Stuart? I'm, I, I agree. <clears throat> so we're moving over on the, in the beehive and he's, he's looking for three things when, it, when you look in a beehive. You look for mood, brood, food. We're actually getting a little bit of misty rain right here. And so this might affect the way the bees go ahead. Did you see anything in there? No, just, this, food, okay. just pollen. Just pollen. Oh, look at that. Look at that pollen frame. Wow. Look at that. See all of that pollen. And again, as Kraz indicated a while ago, that pollen is the protein source. So the bees, when they bring in the pollen, they'll Sorry. actually mix it. There's, yeah, they'll actually mix it with, um, with honey. And then it becomes what's called bee bread and they'll be packed in these cells and they use that for, for here's another queen cell. It's open. You see that on the end right there. And that would be a swarm cell on the outside, on the bottom of the frame. Okay. I'm going to close it up because it's raining. It is starting to rain. So we're going to go ahead and close this up because um, remember in this beehive, as Bonnie indicated, there's probably, this hive probably has 30,000 bees in it. It's got 28,000 female bees and about maybe 2,000 drones at the very, very, very most. Um, can I say this without getting in trouble? Sometimes with that many female bees in there, they can get a little bit temperamental. <laughs> so we, we're, we're careful in, our, uh, in how we handle them. And one of the things that you don't ever want to do is take off a beehive lid at night or in, in the middle of rain. So we are, we're making our way back toward um, homeostasis here and not having any beehives open, letting them kind of do what they want to do. Um, because of the rain, that's a little bit abbreviated, but that also gives us a little bit more time for, for questions, if you might have any. We have gotten some fantastic questions in, um, Stuart. So I'll go ahead and kind of read those off. And um, so, yeah, let's kick it off with, um, we had one person write in with a question of how long does the queen live? And do you typically have one queen per hive? Like I know we saw that there were some queen cells in there. If they are, you know, hatched successfully, do they then go off and find and form their own colony and hive? Um, Tell us a little bit more about that. Actually, that's that's a that's a great question and very insightful. The hive is, as uh, Kraz indicated, has one queen. What will typically happen is when the queen becomes weak and unable to perform her duties, is that the the hive will prepare itself to swarm, and the swarming hive then will leave with the queen, and the new queen will actually take over the reproduction of that particular hive, and. Occasionally, you'll have two queens. For instance, if they supersede and the old queen doesn't die, a mother-daughter queen will oftentimes work together for the good of the hive until the mother queen is unable to lay and dies. Sister queens, however, that are born in the hive will fight to the death, and they will fight until there's only one queen left in the hive. The queen will actually live. Oh, look how prepared Kraz was. The queen can actually live up to two to three years. More likely, she will um, only live probably uh, one or two years, especially in Florida where she's laying eggs all the time and not doesn't have an off season. Remarkably, the honeybee herself, the little honeybees we're looking at, live around 45 days. So every 45 days, all 50,000 bees in that hive are replaced. They'll start out and spend 21 days pupating. They'll spend another 21 days living in the hive and working in the hive. And then the last couple of weeks of their life, they'll actually spend foraging and they will die on the wing. Out foraging, they'll die. And they're replaced at a rate of about 1,500 per day. Uh, wow. Just to add to that a little bit more, a queen when she goes out to collect semen on her on her on her virgin flight, will collect upwards of twenty to fifty million semen. 
and she'll keep stored in her spermatheca, which is the little gland that she keeps in, it sits in her body, but about 7 million active sperm. And she'll lay about 500 to 750,000 eggs in a lifetime. And as Crash said, every egg that comes down the fallopian tube, when it gets to the, before it's laid, she can either fertilize it, worker bee, or not fertilize it, drone bee. And that call is made by the size of the cell. A larger cell, she'll fill it with a drone. Smaller cell, she'll fill it with a worker bee. And the way the bees will let her know is if we have enough drones, they'll fill those empty drone cells with, um, with nectar. And so she won't lay in that cell. And so they regulate their population based on uh, what the worker bees decide is necessary in that hive. It's wow. just fascinating. That, yeah. is, that is very answer, fascinating. Long answer to a short question. That's okay. Uh, that actually leads into another question that we had um, from a listener is when these bees are born, are they born knowing their job as a worker bee or a drone or a queen? Um, how, how is that kind of delineated or, or learn, is it learned or intuitive? That's a good question. You want to tackle that one? First, I, I, the worker bees go in stages. There are jobs that they do throughout their life, and it seems to be um, genetic that they know how to do it. They, they, they will jump jobs sometimes depending on the needs of the hive. So early in uh, a worker bees, well, let's just go, go to a drone has one job. Its only job is to go out and mate. So that's, that's programmed in and that's all he does and consume food and be taken care of in the nest. And, and, the, and the, yeah. When you're talking to a group of, uh, at, a, at a, a group of women, they look at each other and say, hmm, <laughs> that's all he does. Eats resources and, and, uh, and make sure the queen is properly fertilized. That's all she does. He does. Yeah. The downside is that they die, uh, you know, when that happens. So, but, but the, the other, the queen knows her job too. Her job is basically delineated by the workers. So the workers will, uh, in the group mentality, the hive mentality, will kind of instruct the queen what she needs to do. So if she's got good genetics and she's a good layer and her, her pheromones are strong, she will continue to be a good laying queen doing what she's instructed to by the workers, um, by the size of the, again, by the size of the cells and what needs to be done now the workers have the really interesting jobs delineated out. Um, when they're young, their wings are not strong enough for them to be flying bees, forager bees. So they take undertake the jobs, literally undertake the jobs. Uh, they're an undertaker. They take out the, the trash. Um, they, care, they get rid of the dead bees and the other things that aren't supposed to be in there. They, uh, then they become attendant queens. Well, actually they become nurse bees. So what they'll do is they'll then bring in a nectar, you know, take ne nectar from a forager and put it in a cell. They'll uh, take and feed the brood different, um, you, you know, either bee bread, which is that nectar and pollen or just royal jelly if they're gonna need a new queen. So it's, it's a nurse bee. And then the nurse bee can move on to be a queen attendant. And then from the queen attendant, I might be skipping some of these stages, but the queen attendant, uh, once they get their wings and ready to fly and they do some test flights around the colony, uh, around the hive to see where they are and to get their navigation system squared away, they become flying bees. And then they'll go out and they'll forage and bring back uh, food. And they'll also be defender bees. They'll defend the outside of the colony if they need to fly out and and make somebody know in defense that they're there and, and sacrifice themselves with a sting, uh, which will kill the bee when the, when the bee um, puts their stinger into uh, flesh that makes that stinger stick. When they separate, push, pull away, their stinger will separate from their body, leaving a pumping organism that's pumping venom into the, the, the Attack, perpetrator. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that, that honeybee will die. That, that, um, that worker bee will die. And let me just say, add to what Kraz is saying, that's a, that's a good de uh, description. The queen is actually determined, it's called epigenetics or above genetics. Any egg that's laid, that's a female egg that is less than four days old can be selected by the hive, fed only royal jelly, and it will develop into the queen bee that you've seen. So the queen, wow. it's, it's totally random, but any, any egg that is selected can be turned into a queen and the, and the bees will decide when a queen is needed. Uh, it's called, and so, like I said, the, the drone 
is an unfertilized egg that becomes a, a drone bee. Worker bees are fertilized eggs that are fed a mixture of bee bread and uh, royal jelly. The queen has been selected and she will only receive royal jelly her entire life, which will, which will um, allow her to develop as a queen. Interesting, interesting. I had no idea that they each had different stages of their jobs kind of throughout their life cycle and you yeah. know, evolved up to their, you know, I mean, their main job, I guess. Right. Um, we had another very interesting question come in um, that relates over to the West Coast and the severe drought that the West Coast is experiencing, yeah. the forest yeah. fires and whatnot. How does that impact the weather the weather systems over on the west coast how are those impacting honeybees honeybees if at all yeah it can have a very deleterious effect if there's no forage and the bees don't have don't have enough honey stores they can uh, they can starve to death so beekeepers we have to keep an eye on that and if we look in the hive and we mentioned that mood brood food we looked in the hive the hives are happy they're they're not problematic um there's a lot of brood going on, but there's no stores. We will add sugar water to the top of the hive, a mixture half, half uh, by weight of sugar and water, uh, sucrose, and they will actually consume that. They can make, they can survive on that and, and live through drought seasons and things like that. But yes, it's, you have to sometimes as a beekeeper, now feral colonies don't have that advantage and they'll die. But managed colonies, we always manage for food, make sure they have enough, even in drought times. Interesting. That's a good question. Good, yeah. Um, we had a few other questions come in about your getup, though, of what you guys are wearing. Um, <laughs> so uh, just a, 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 you know, two little questions on that. Um, describe your outfit to us and does it have any like technology to help keep you guys cool i know we're, we're coming into florida summer here so you've got to be toasty well well, well Kraz is, is is sporting the latest in bee beware you'll notice the uh, <laughs> it's called a fencing veil and this veil keeps bees out and you'll notice that all of the clothing is uh, ventilated it's got it's got ventilation but at the same time it allows uh does not allow bees to actually get through and, and sting his his body I, on the other hand, am sporting a veil, a, a regular, a regular veil, and I wear a very thick shirt. I have a long sleeve t-shirt under this just to keep the bees out. Um, and, and that's basically what you do. You never go into a beehive. You never go around bees without having protection for your eyes. Uh, a bee sting in the actual um, cornea can actually cause you to lose sight in your eyes. So you always wear a veil, even though you find different different levels of bee care and different levels of protection that a beekeeper is caught with, depending on your level of uh, how much you enjoy pain and how much you enjoy stings. Is there, <laughs> and by is the there way, any type of special cleaner that you need, like yeah. detergents, you know, can you not use, do you use fragrant, fragrant free detergents if you're gonna be around the bees for your, you know, out your, your clothes? Most beekeepers I know haven't washed their bee clothes in months, so it really doesn't matter. <laughs> the pheromones, the pheromones matter. Um, all natural. All natural. So yeah, but no, that's a good question. You, you we, yeah, I, I don't use any special preparation or anything like that. Just regular, regular uh, uh, soap and water. And it is interesting that if if you are latently exposed to stings on your hive. And for instance, a beekeeper's family, you take it in the house, into the house and, and they're exposed to the, the um, pheromones and to the venom, oftentimes have a propensity to develop uh, an allergy more so than somebody's actually stung. And we actually have beekeepers who are in beekeeping in our club who practice what's called apotherapy. Uh, one of our members has a history of Lyme disease. So he actually gets 10 stings a, uh, at a time three times a week. His wife administers those stings and I think she enjoys it just a little bit too much. Uh, she, she takes the bee with a pair of pliers or the pair with the tweezers, places it on his skin and he will be stung. And the, the poison supposedly will has a deleterious effect on the spherocetes, which are in mature Lyme disease, very problematic and no antibiotics will touch, but that bee venom supposedly will. I've actually heard of um, bee venom as a treatment for Lyme disease before. Uh -huh. so that's very interesting. Um, another kind of broader question, what can we do, you know, what can we do as individuals to help the bees in our, at our home and in general, what can we do? One of the things we talked about was forage. 
in, in Florida, we have cabbage palms and these big palm trees and, and different times of year, they, they, they fluoresce and they have all of those big plumes that come out with flowers all over them. And the first thing your yard guy does is goes out and cuts that down because the flowers are going everywhere. Don't do that. Leave them up, leave them up until the flowers die. That, that particular fluorescing um, plume has as many um, flowers in it as 10 or 20 acres of, of wildlife. So um, a couple of years ago, my neighbor did that. And so I'm, I'm dragging them back across the yard. My wife saw me and said, you've got to be kidding me. I actually hung it on a fence in my yard for a couple of days to at least allow the bees to get all the uh, nectar they possibly could out of that particular um, thing. So one of the things is, is that. Be, be mindful of, of what's going on uh, as far as flowers. Be, be very careful with your pesticide use. Remember, the label is the law. And if you think one teaspoon of pesticide is good and two teaspoons should be better, you're breaking the law. Don't do that. Uh, the, the label is the law. And so be very judicious in how you administer pesticides in your yard. And at, if at all possible, plant flowers that that bloom and flower, not just green hedges. Uh, monoculture is the, wor is the bee's worst enemy. You drive down the road, beautiful green plants, beautiful green plants, no flowers, don't do that. And a lot of people, a lot of people want a green yard and they'll have companies that spray weed killer and pesticide combinations on their yard just mm -hmm. to keep a green yard. And that is detrimental to the colonies. If the, even if they, uh, uh, the actual poison itself doesn't get to the a hive body, the bees foraging around will get that on them, bring it back to the colony and the buildup of those pesticides and toxins in the wax and in the box can cause the entire colony to collapse and a lot of the other bees around it. So uh, spraying your yard for a green yard is questionable at best. I'll, I'll, put, I'll leave it there. I, I would wish people wouldn't do as much. Of that. And that's kind of the same message you all use then when you do certain things, you trip in the yard, how often do those pesticides and um, fertilizers end up into the Indian River Lagoon, which is the major source of problems. So if you'll practice good management of the Indian River Lagoon, you're also probably practicing good management of bees. Right. And uh, that's a great lead into a reminder that today is the first day of the fertilizer ban here in Brevard County. So um, don't fertilize your year on between June 1st and September 30th. And you know, planting natives and pollinator gardens, they're gorgeous. You know, you get some really incredible bugs and insects to your yard and just the wildlife is, is, is remarkable. So yes, we, we very much encourage the same thing. Um, you know, don't fertilize, don't use pesticides and insecticides and really trying to plant, plant pollinator gardens. Um, let's see, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and this, this is an interesting one for both of you. How, how did both of you get into beekeeping and what's your favorite part about it? Go ahead, Chris. Well, I, I, I actually don't remember the, what sparked my interest. I think I saw a friend of mine get into beekeeping and the first, and the first thing I wanted to do was run out and go get a beehive but I didn't know what to do. And so instead of just taking that bold move of ordering bees in the mail, which I recommend not doing right away on an impulse, um, I went out and sought the local beekeeping clubs to give me information for me to be able to put my hands on frames, to go out to the apiaries, to learn, learn, learn from more beekeepers before I even bought a suit or a box um, to, in preparation of getting bees. And so once I, once I started coming out, I, I became more of just interested to more obsessed to more addicted. Now, now I'm a bee, I'm, I'm totally a, addicted to bees and, and beekeeping. That's great. You know, it's interesting. One of the people asked a few weeks ago, they said, what's the major risk of becoming a beekeeper. And I think it was Kraz, our comedian, who said, going broke, <laughs> getting, <laughs> addicted, getting addicted and to the point that you keep doing more and more things. Yeah. Um, but, but yes, and I would just, let me just put a plug in for our club, our South Brevard Beekeepers Club. We have a Facebook page, go to the South Brevard Beekeepers, ask to join. And when it says we have followed the rules, if you'll, if you'll agree not to go on and talk politics, we'll let you in the club. And all we'll talk about on there is bees. So click yes, you can join the club, you can join the dialogues and all that. There's no charge, you can join all the dialogues. Our meetings are the second Tuesday of every month 
And every Sunday afternoon, we meet at the club apiary, and we actually do just what you're doing here, except on sitting behind a, t a screen, you're actually got your hands in the beehive. If you'll show up wearing blue jeans and a heavy shirt and uh, with a collar, closed toed shoes, we will give you the gloves and the hat that you need so you can actually participate and learn about beekeeping and get involved very quickly and very easily. Awesome. Awesome. And everybody, I will get that information from Stuart and I will include it in the follow up email I'm sending out tomorrow morning um, with the link to view this again on YouTube, if you should so choose. Um, and also, you know, how to how to get in touch with Stuart and the South Brevard beekeepers and get some more information and get involved. So thank you, Stuart and Kraz and Bonnie. We really appreciate this. This is an awesome presentation. Thank you guys so, so much. Um, and thank you to all of you for logging on today. And I hope everybody has a wonderful afternoon. Go plant some pollinator gardens. There you go. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>